third question here, Mike, <clears throat> in episode 37, I kind of reference the dinosaurs, how I think, uh, you know, in Genesis chapter one, maybe that's where between one and two Adam and Eve is created and millions of years could have passed. And I kind of mentioned maybe that's where, you, you know, for me personally, my opinion, that's where the dinosaurs are. And John, one of our listeners emailed me um, just a basically a statement, but uh, I'm going to throw it as a question towards you. Um, he uh, he said that there may well be a reference to what may be called the dinosaurs in Scripture. Genesis one twenty one mentions creation of the. Boy, you're gonna have to help me on this Hebrew. Yeah, you sent me that. The Tananim Gedolim. There you go, Tananim Gedolim. Gedolim. There you yeah. go. So he, um, I don't, <laughs> and so he was wondering. Uh, Big dragons, great yeah. dragons, <laughs> that yep. kind of thing. Yep. In some places, they're called great sea creatures. Ezekiel twenty nine mm-hmm. three refers to them as crocodiles. He says. True or false? Other well, places? I, apparently sure, you refer to them as dragons, like you just said, or or what? Could you maybe just a touch on that and elaborate? Yeah. Yeah, this is actually a really complicated question. Uh, just generally up front, I don't see any evidence in the Bible for dinosaurs. I don't, I don't see how biblical writers would have known uh, about dinosaurs unless they ran across a skeleton or something like that. And But again, they how would they process that? They'd probably call it a dragon. Uh, I don't see any evidence for, you know, living dinosaurs during the biblical period or anything like that. So, you know, have, having said that, I don't think the biblical material really pertains to uh, what we would think of as dinosaurs at all anyway. And here's here's why it gets really complicated. You have this term, tanin or taninim, uh, you know, the both of them can actually be plural endings in Semitic, but I don't want to digress into that. These things, these creatures, we'll just call them, are mentioned in connection with several themes in the Old Testament. Now, the question sort of situates one of them. Genesis 121 is obviously a creation theme. Now, before we, we even hit the language, we, we need to back up and, and think about Genesis 1. There are a number of scholars. It's not so prevalent now as it was, oh, I don't know, a few decades ago. But because you have creation episodes, creation descriptions outside of Genesis 1 in the Bible that have God slaying a dragon or a sea monster, Psalm 74 is probably the best example here. Because you have those scenes, that sort of triggered a whole way of approaching all creation texts in Genesis at least one time. And the reason is this. If you look at Psalm 74, the notion was, look, here here the God of Israel is slaying this great sea beast, and that's associated with creation language. It's also, as I'll point out in a few minutes, associated with Exodus language. But let's stick with creation now, this one category. Since God is slaying this beast and that is associated with the act of creation. This is just like certain Babylonian creation stories. The, the, the biggest example would be Enuma Elish, where in the end, you know, Marduk slays, you know, a great sea dragon and chops the, you know, the carcass, it, it splits it in half, and out of one half he makes the sea, and the other half makes the dry land. So the, you know, the the or the, the sky and the dry land. And so you've got, you know, this destruction of this beast. And out of that comes the heavens and the earth. And in the Babylonian story, Marduk, when he does this, brings order out of chaos because the, the sea dragon, the sea beast was just, you know, making life miserable or, or making, making creation impossible. Uh, and so Marduk wanted to make the earth habitable for humans. And so this beast has to be slain. And then the heavens and earth that humans will inhabit and, and experience are created thereby. So it's this, it's this story of bringing order out of chaos. And the Babylonian material uses, again, as a, as a chaos symbol, a great sea beast. Now, the, the reason why you see that not only in Babylonian material, but also in lots of other material, is that the sea was otherworldly to an ancient Near Eastern person, really any ancient person. And it's because it isn't where people live. You can't live in the sea. You can't live in the sea. The sea is chaotic. It's untamable. It's wild. It's threatening. 
it, it's, you'll die if you're not, you know, on a boat, you know, that, that kind of thing. It, it, it's unpredictable. The sea was an otherworldly place. And you'll actually get you know, like Egyptian texts that talk about smaller bodies of water uh, on, the, on the periphery of their boundaries. And the, the Egyptians will actually refer to bodies of water like the, the, the sea, which is, it, which is the end, or you know, the, they'll equate the sea with the afterlife or, or the netherworld because it, it, to them it spoke of unpredictability and death and, and humans can't live there that kind of thing. So it, it was just an otherworldly place. Now, when you have, when you're out on the sea in a boat and you see big animals in it, you know, whether they're whales or sharks or whatever it is, you, you tend to associate those things, these huge creatures that again, don't live on land. They're not things you normally see, but they live in this otherworldly place. They lend themselves to again, being portrayals, symbolic portrayals of that place. And that's why you have in the ancient Near East a lot of this kind of symbology, great sea creatures that represent chaos and death and disorder and all this kind of stuff. Well, Enuma Elish, the Babylonian story, again, since the supposition was that, and you get this in, in biblical literature, you get it in Mesopotamian literature, you get it in Egyptian literature, that before there was any land to inhabit for human habitation there was just water and so the primeval mound rises up out of the water either at the command of the god or is created by the god uh, from some pre-existing material in this case it's the carcass at least half the carcass of this great sea beast so marduk you know brings order out of chaos and creates dry land for human habitation and of course marduk creates people too and all that kind of stuff so since scholars were familiar with these stories when they would look at a, a passage like psalm 74 they thought well that you know that's really a good match you know for this whole idea and then they'd go back to genesis 1 and ask well is this stuff in genesis 1 and what you get is, is you get really two things. You get Genesis one twenty one, the reference to the Tani Nim, uh, and you also get the word to home, which is in most English translations translated the deep. Now to home, uh, again, a few decades ago, this was accepted as a coherent argument. It's not so much now, and I'll explain why. But to home was thought to be the the Hebrew equivalent of Tiamat which was the name of the sea dragon in the Babylonian Enuma Elish story. And so the supposition was to home and Taninim. There, there's no battle going on in Genesis 1. And so what the writer of Genesis 1 is trying to convey is that when the God of Israel, who's the real creator, started doing his thing, these forces were already held in check. There was no need for a battle. They were submissive and bound. And so it was a theological polemic. It was a theological uh, slant uh, to how the Israelite you know, viewed creation, that, that our God doesn't even need to have this fight. Now, of course, that doesn't work in Psalm 74. But again, this, is, this was the thinking. Now, nowadays, what you have is in Psalm 74, the reference to Leviathan there, uh, and you also get Levi you get Leviathan referred to in Psalm 74. Let me just go to the passage, or find the passage here, and read it for people. Uh, Psalm 74, beginning in verse 12, the psalmist says, "Yet God, my King, is from of old, working salvation in the midst of the earth. You divided the sea by your might. You broke the heads of the sea monsters." And there's our word Tananim. Uh, on or in the waters. You crushed the heads of Leviathan. You gave him as food for the creatures of the wilderness. Now, that's odd. I, th I thought we were in the sea. Now we're in the wilderness all of a sudden. Because in verse 14, it's going to transition to Exodus language, and then it's going to go back to creation language. You get to verse 16, we're establishing the heavenly lights and the sun, fixing the boundaries of the earth. Again, this is language right out of Genesis 1. So there's something going on there. But to get back to the point, people looked at this and thought, well, Leviathan, you know, that that doesn't look anything like Tahome. It doesn't look like anything like Tiamat. And, you know, what's going on here? Well, in 1929, the Ugaritic material was discovered. OK, uh, again, prior to that discovery, all the Babel, everything was sort of Babylonian oriented when it came to Genesis, at least in the academic world. And, it, you know, 
it, it took a little while for Ugaritic material to get translated and sort of become, you know, the, a scholarly focus. But the point is that nowadays people look at Psalm 74 and they don't see the Babylonian story. They see the Ugaritic story because in the Ugaritic story, you have the same terms. You have Tanun or tanuni, Tanuna. Again, it's the same thing as the Tanunim. And you also have Lotan or Liu Yatan, which is the same thing as Leviathan in the Hebrew Bible. And, and that story, the Ugaritic story, is not about the creation of the world. It's about who who is supreme in the divine council. And in the Babylonian story, uh, you read through that the Baal cycle, Baal eventually emerges as the top dog, uh, the, the vice regent, uh, under still under El's authority. But he becomes the, the chosen uh, co-ruler among all the other gods. And he does so by destroying, defeating uh, Litanu, uh, you know, winning this battle. And so since the terminology is so close, scholars looked at it and thought, well, you know, this is such a close match. It's got to be this instead of the Babylonian stuff. And then they took that back to Genesis 1 and said, you know, this is probably not, you know, aimed at the Babylonians. It's probably, again, a reference to, uh, in this case, Canaanite religion, the, the Baal stuff that, that again, to home there's actually a Ugaritic word for that that means the the recesses of the deep, just like our English translations of Tahom would have, you know, the deep. So that made sense. But it was also the place where, again, these sea creatures lived. And since the sea creatures, Tananim, is sort of used to as an equivalent to Leviathan in Psalm 74, the idea was that, hey, Genesis 1 is, is really describing uh, Leviathan Le, you know, Litanu already subdued by the God of Israel. And so the focus of the comparison changed uh, in that respect. So that was a, a long way of explaining how an ancient Near Eastern person would look at this. They're not seeing dinosaurs like you and I would think of them. This is about uh, chaos language and chaos symbology that is drawn from, you know, the otherworldly place known as the sea or the ocean. But the whole point of their stories is, again, things like who who restrains chaos, who is the king of the gods. And so when the biblical writer starts taking this kind of material and swapping in Yahweh, it, the, the point is theological. It's not paleonto paleontological or biological. Uh, it, it's, it's a slap in the face of of what a Canaanite would believe. If, if you have a, a new Gritic person or a Canaanite person happen to read or hear the biblical story of creation, they would get it instantly that you're dissing Baal. You're dissing our God. You're, you're saying your God's the real creator. You're saying your God's better. And, and the, old, the first 11 chapters of Genesis are just cluttered with that kind of thing. Uh, there's a lot of, there is still a lot of Mesopotamian stuff. When my book Unseen Realm comes out, the whole Genesis 6 theme is, is cast against the Apkalu of from Babylon, these semi-divine giant figures and all that kind of stuff. I mean, there Genesis one through eleven takes swipes at just about everything in the religious world of the ancient Near East, and you even get Egyptian stuff. Uh, the, the whole idea of creation by the spoken word uh, it actually is a swipe at the e Egyptian god Ta. Because the Ta's Memphite theology in, in uh, Egyptian literature is the only other place in the ancient world, ancient Near Eastern world, ancient Mediterranean world, that describes creation by the spoken word, by the breath of the mouth. And so it, it's a very deliberate swipe at that point of that story, of that theology, uh, that the biblical writer wants to make sure that they're hitting all the bases, it's essentially that they're, they're, they're not going to leave any any other rival claim of any other deity untouched. They're going to hit them all. And that's what they do in, in the Genesis story. So you have creation themes for these, you know, this dragon language or these, the sea beast language. You, and you have, again, what, what you'd have, what I guess I could describe as sort of theological polemic going on. But the third thing you have is you have, Historical enemies of the people of God, Pharaoh and Nebuchadnezzar, are both described with this terminology, either Leviathan or Taninim or you know something like that. In other words, they are they are 
they are painted uh, with the same terminology again, because now the Pharaoh, the oppressing Pharaoh, and Nebuchadnezzar, we all know what he did. These are the prime enemies of the people of God. They are the embodied forces of chaos against God's people. And that's why this language is attributed to them. Can we? Can all of us think in the audience of a New Testament example where the, the great enemy of God is associated in some way with a dragon? Hello, the book of Revelation. Okay, you get, and, and a lot of that draws on Isaiah 24 to 27, which is apocalyptic literature in Isaiah, that guess what? The day of the Lord comes and Leviathan is finally destroyed. I mean, there, there's, there's sort of a network of ideas. This is a network of ideas that tracks through certain portions of the Old Testament and certain portions of the New Testament. And so if you're asking me, and of course you are, that is how I view all of this such language, because it's bigger than the, than the Bible itself. You will find this sort of thing uh, in religious texts, in, in uh, mythologies across the ancient world. And I don't think coincidentally, they're drawn from sort of the same bag of tricks. It's the sea and the creatures in the sea, because again, that's just a horrifying, terrifying place. You are not safe when you're out on the sea. It's unpredictable, it's wild, it's untamed, it's chaotic. You could die real fast. And again, because of who they were, uh, sort of a, you know, we can look at it and say it's kind of primitive thinking. Okay, well, so what if it is? But I mean, this is the way they thought about these things and the way they conveyed certain ideas. And so that's how I approach this sort of monster language in the Old Testament. And I think it's that's the way it needs to be approached because it's consistent both within and outside the Bible. So what you're saying is in Revelations, it could be a T-Rex coming at us, right? <laughs> no, I don't think we're going to see a real T-Rex. Okay, because that's much more scarier to me. I see a T-Rex <laughs> coming. It's got seven heads. You know, I don't know. Well, I'd, 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 I'd take that, <laughs> something you could actually probably take down with a, with a, with a good-sized bomb as opposed to... <laughs> Something I mean, that's uh, satanic, you know. Jurassic just... Park's got a whole new meaning to me. If I'm watching it, I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> no. I appreciate you going into detail with all that. That that, that information.